What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. I'm really excited to bring today's video to you because, ironically, despite the American Blonde Ale being one of the easiest and simplest beers you can brew, I've never made one before. That's right, in all my years of brewing, I've never actually made an American Blonde Ale. I've made pale ales galore, I've made cream ales, I've made American lagers, I have made IPAs, I've made everything adjacent to the American Blonde Ale except for the American Blonde Ale. Um, so now we're gonna change that. It unfortunately gets kind of a bad rap as a boring beer, and I am guilty of saying that on camera. Uh, here on my channel. I've said the American Blonde Ale is boring. That's sometimes true. It is your kind of standard lawnmower beer, um, but it is up to the brewer to make it interesting. And I think today we're going to try and make this a more interesting blonde ale. Blonde Ale is a lightly flavored, kind of malt-focused beer um, with American hops in it. It's very similar to a cream ale, except you're not using any sort of corn or rice adjunct. You can if you want to, but it then it turns into more of a cream ale. I'm, I'm not going to get into semantics, but um, basically you're looking at more of a barley malt base here for a Blonde Ale. Uh, and then you're going to be adding some American hop character to it. It should not be a boring beer hop-wise. It should not have uh, a lack of hop character. There should be some nice, I think, perfect Personally, a nice floral hop character really would suit this beer very, very well. It should have some kind of bitterness to it, but most importantly, it should not get to that level of being an American Pale Ale. Blonde Ale sits below American Pale Ale in terms of hoppiness, which obviously sits below American IPA in terms of hoppiness. It's important to not encroach upon turning this into a Pale Ale or something more because then it just changes exactly what you're looking at. This beer honestly is really easy to make. I think it's quite rewarding to make too, especially if you're a new all grain brewer. Um, this might be one of your first adventures into making a pale beer and trust me it's quite worth it these are underrated beers I think in this video I'm also going to show you how to try out new dry hops without sacrificing your entire batch of beer so stay tuned for that later on in the video before we jump into the recipe I would like to give a shout out to a couple organizations for helping make the video possible firstly Northern Brewer where you can find all of the ingredients that you need for this batch of beer and secondly Blickman Engineering I'll be using their brew easy compact surface 240 volt system for today's brew and lastly, Vivor, which is the manufacturer of the pressurized growler I'll be showing off later on in this video. So the recipe for this beer is really very simple. In terms of malt, there's really only two malts, and honestly, you could get away with using a single malt in this one. This is a very good candidate for a smash beer. This is not a smash beer today, but um, it would work very well. So for starters, I'm gonna use 10 pounds of pale ale malt. Um, pale ale malt is actually quite different than two-row pale malt. So most of us know your standard base brewer's malt malt is two row pale malt. Uh, pale ale malt is basically one degree lava bond darker than that. You're gonna commonly see things like Marisotter and Golden Promise. Those are pale ale malts, um, but it's very different than your standard two row. It has much more flavor to it, I think, and something that suits this kind of beer very, very well. It will cause it to be a bit darker in the end. I'm happy though with that color trade off for flavor because I think uh, Blonde Ale really does deserve to have good high quality flavor from the malt. Honestly though, you can use any base malt you want for this style, Pilsner, Turo, whatever you want. Um, I'm just gonna be using pale ale malt specifically if you wanna copy this recipe exactly. And then on top of that, we're adding only a single specialty malt and a very small amount of it, just a quarter pound, four ounces of honey malt. Honey malt's not a malt that I actually brew with all that often, uh, but it's cool. It adds a uh, very nice honey note to the beer. It's very similar to melanoidin malt or aromatic malt, uh, but honey malt is, uh, I think, gonna shine really, really nicely in this particular beer. For hops, again, emphasis on this not being a hoppy beer. There should be noticeable hop character, but not to the degree of an American pale ale. So it will have some bitterness, it will have some flavor, um, but it really shouldn't be all that much. So we're looking at a total IBU of 19, just to keep things in perspective. So uh, our bittering edition is gonna be Columbus, and I'm gonna be using a quarter ounce of that at 60 minutes uh, for about 12 IBUs, and then I'm going to add two ounces of Cascade to the beer. Uh, one ounce going in at 10 minutes, and then one ounce going in at zero minutes. That should give us another seven IBUs to get us up to 19. For the yeast in this beer, I just recommend using a clean American ale yeast. Um, I'm gonna be using, instead of my typical USFI, I'm gonna be using Lalaman BRY97. Very similar strain. I last brewed with BRY97 about two years ago when I made a red rye ale, and it turned out phenomenally. Um, I really found myself enjoying the way that yeast works. So I'll be using that in today's brew. Pretty easy to get your hands on this stuff. 
For the water on this beer, I'm gonna be choosing a balanced profile. Um, I don't think there should be a lack of minerality in this beer, but I also don't think it should be going overboard. So just do what you need to do to target a relatively neutral profile um, with some minerality in it. Um, if you want to push the hops more, then consider bumping up the sulfates. If you want to push the malt more, then consider bumping up the chloride. Um, but for me, I'm choosing a pretty much perfectly balanced profile so that both of them get a relatively even uh, kick from the water profile. That profile is 59 parts per million of calcium, 13 parts per million of magnesium, 26 parts per million of sodium, 104 parts per million of chloride, 107 parts per million of sulfate, and zero added bicarbonates. So in order to get that water profile, I'll be starting out with eight gallons of reverse osmosis water and adding to that three grams of gypsum, four grams of epsom, two grams of sodium chloride, and four grams of calcium chloride. For the mash on this one, it's a simple beer, so there's really no need to get very creative with the mash either. So a plain old 60 minute rest at 152 degrees should get the job done just fine. Anyway guys, I'm excited to get this beer going. Um, it's been a while since I've had a solid lawnmower beer on tap, so um, without further ado, let's get brewing. I started out by adding 8 gallons of reverse osmosis water to my 10 gallon 240 volt Blickman Brew Easy compact surface and started to heat that up to the mash temperature of 152 Fahrenheit. While the strike water was heating up, I also measured out my water salts and added those into the water and also milled out all of my grain. Once the water had reached the target mash in temperature, I doed in with the entire grain mill, being sure to mix it up thoroughly, break up any dough clumps, and set up the recirculation arm. I let the mash sit and recirculate for an hour, and then raised it up to a mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes before pulling out the grain basket and letting that drain for another 15 minutes. Once the grain basket had finished draining, I went ahead and raised everything up to a boil. Once I hit that boil, I added in my bittering addition, which was a quarter ounce of Columbus at 60 minutes, and then waited for another 50 minutes before adding my one ounce of Cascade at the 10 minute mark. At this time, I also added a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and added one more ounce of Cascade and uh, then initiated a Whirlpool to start coagulating all the trube and hop debris in a nice cone in the center of the kettle. Once that Whirlpool was complete, I went ahead and chilled in one pass through my counterflow chiller into my anvil bucket fermenter. Once I'd collected all the word in my fermenter, I waited until the temperature of the wort reached about 65 degrees, and then I added in my one packet of Lalamand BRY97 dry yeast. At this time, I also collected an original gravity measurement and found it to be 1046, which was pretty much exactly on target, so I was very happy. All right, so now let's talk about the fermentation for this beer. This is a relatively simple beer, but it can get screwed up in fermentation as all beers can. So number one, just be sure you're always pitching enough yeast, be sure you're pitching your yeast at appropriate temperatures, and be sure that you're taking care of your fermentation and not letting it uh, take wild swings all over the place uh, in terms of temperature. If you do all of those things, you're generally gonna be fine no matter which yeast you pitched into the beer. But if you're trying to make a really stylistically representative blonde ale, I would recommend sticking with a clean, neutral American ale yeast. There's a good handful of different American ale yeasts out there, uh, but most notably, Fermentus US05 and Lalaman BRY97 are gonna be your most common ones in terms of dry format. Um, any sort of derivative of the Chico strain is really gonna be what I would point you towards in terms of a generally uh, appropriate yeast for this particular style, but there's a lot you can do with this one. Maybe throw a Kolsch strain at it. Maybe throw a hybrid lager strain at it. You can experiment with yeast in this beer as well. It's uh, quite a good template for it. It's also a great candidate to use a nice Kvike strain with, something like Voss or Lutra. Honestly, would be my recommendations. They're so easy to find and so easy to use. No matter what strain you choose, honestly, the biggest advice I have for you in terms of fermentation for this particular beer, though, is just try to keep the fermentation temperature on the lower end of whatever the temperature spectrum is for the yeast that you're using. So for my BRY97, that means keeping things between about 65 and 68 degrees. The reason for this is so that we minimize the amount of fruity esters uh, that can happen as a result of fermenting American ale yeast a bit hotter. If you ferment these yeasts hot, they will get a little bit fruity, and it also kind of tends to throw out a little bit of diacetyl too uh, if you're fermenting at a higher temperature. So just try to keep an eye out for that. Honestly though, if you're keeping it around 65, 68, then you shouldn't have any sort of issues with it. Uh, you can pressure ferment this one too if you don't have the ability to get your yeast down that low. Um, they'll do just fine under pressure and it'll be um, just as clean. 
at the end of the day, it's your beer. You do what you want with it, but those are my recommendations. Just to recap, what I'll be doing is uh, pitching in one packet of beer Y97 uh, and fermenting that at 65 degrees to 68 degrees for about a week, uh, maybe a bit longer, depending on how long it takes to actually ferment through. Um, but once that final gravity is hit, the beer really should be ready. This is an easy drinking beer that is uh, not gonna require any conditioning time. And because I'm not dry hopping this one, it'll be ready even faster. So there's no real need to wait on it once it hits that final gravity. If it's tasting good, it's gonna go right into the keg. Fermentation for the Blonde Ale went really fast uh, and completed in about seven days, which was great. So BRY97 is a fast fermenting yeast and it, it is a solid workhorse. As soon as it hit that final gravity, I did a quick taste test to confirm that there was no diacetyl or other unpleasant fermentation byproducts in the beer, and there were not, so I went ahead and put it on tap. All in all, this beer was officially grain of glass in one week. So the beer is called Golden Ticket, and it comes in at 5.4% ABV and about 19 IBUs. For the appearance of the beer, it is pouring perfectly clear and a nice golden color, um, a bit darker actually than I was anticipating, which I think is due to the contribution of color from the honey malt. Uh, and the head on the beer is actually really, really nice. It's a, a nice fluffy white head, uh, very good construction, very good head retention, sticks around for a long time and leaves great lacing on the glass. Let's go in for aroma. So the aroma on this one's actually pretty delicate and light. Um, the biggest components I'm getting are like a grapefruit and kind of like a floral note. Um, maybe a little bit of uh, like a lemony citrus. Um, no, really more of a grapefruit citrus to be honest. It's really signature cascade aroma right there. But uh, now let's go in for mouthfeel. As far as drinkability goes, this beer is very, very drinkable. Um, being rather dry compared to what I expected it to be, um, this actually did uh, increase its drinkability quite a bit. It's a light mouthfeel, but it's still got something good there, uh, something substantial uh, enough to actually carry some flavor through. It's a balanced mouthfeel, it's light bodied beer. Not too much to talk about in that department. So now let's go in for flavor. Mm hmm. Mm. So first of all, flavor on this beer, it's quite delicious. This is a, um, it's hop forward for being a blonde ale. So the first flavor you're gonna get out of this is without a doubt hops. Uh, the Cascade really did come through in a nice way and um, it's really presenting itself with some quite nice notes of grapefruit and floral accents. There's maybe a touch of like piney resinousness in there as well, um, but that's about it. But it's a very light flavor, it's an initial bitterness and initial hop flavor, and then it fades into a really pleasant malt flavor, which is just basically nice white bread character, a little bit of um, that honey malt is coming through. Unfortunately, that honey malt seriously darkened the beer a lot more than I expected it would. Um, this is supposedly an SRM of 5.5, uh, which is on the high end for a blonde ale, and it's a little bit darker than I would have liked. I think it adds a nice, slight, subtle honey flavor to the beer, and I'm pretty happy with the way that that works, at least flavor-wise. Some slight edges of biscuity maltiness on this as well, um, which I think also comes from that pale ale malt choice as opposed to using regular Turo. Um, and I'm actually really happy with the malt dimensions of this beer. It's really not supposed to be a very highly flavored beer, though. This is, without a doubt, a lawnmower beer. It's a beer you're supposed to be able to drink and not really think about too much. Um, it's got a nice balanced hop character, it's got a nice balanced maltiness, it's very easy to drink, and um, at 5.4% it's not going to bowl you over either. So it's actually a really solid, just all around beer. That's a beer for beer's sake, kind of, you know what I mean? It's absolutely got way more character than a light lager. Um, it's not quite a pale ale, but it's close. Um, and I did kind of push the boundaries, I think, a little bit on the hoppiness, but it's still a really 
solid beer. And for what it's worth, this works any time of year. I know it's winter right now, but this would be a phenomenal summer beer. Um, and I think, you know, with that little honey malt addition, it adds it a little bit of character that is not in every blonde ale, which makes this a bit more interesting, at least for me. And then of course the yeast just got right out of the way. There's absolutely no yeast character in this at all. Just super clean, super simple. Um, exactly what I needed to have out of that yeast. So this beer is pretty good, all things considered, but it's not really the world's most interesting beer, right? So one of the best ways to make a otherwise not super interesting beer much more interesting is to add some dry hops to it. And that's why I wanted to talk today about one of the best ways to try out new dry hops that you've never used before without sacrificing your entire batch in case the flavor doesn't quite work out. And that is by adding them to a growler. Um, and so today I have the Vivor pressurized growler tap system here. This is a half gallon double wall insulated growler that has the ability to hold pressure. And then by the use of this miniature CO2 regulator here, you can actually hook up a small CO2 cartridge like you use for a paintball gun. Just gonna get the food grade one. Um, and you can put top pressure on the beer that's inside your growler so that you can actually pour it using a standard tap faucet. So I'm gonna test this out by transferring some beer from the keg into this growler. And then I'm gonna add a very small hop bag and add maybe a quarter ounce or half an ounce of Racal hops into it. Let the beer sit on the hops for maybe two days, maybe three days at a colder temperature. And then we'll go ahead and pour the beer and see how just a little bit of a Racal dry hop changes this thing. I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens. So I'll catch up to you guys in a few days when this is all set. So the dry hops have been sitting on the beer in the growler for several days at a relatively cold temperature in the fridge, and I'm really excited to try them and see what the difference is between the two beers. But right away, we can tell there's an immediate visual difference with uh, the base beer here being absolutely crystal clear and the dry hopped beer having a very solid haze to it. Um, not like a super stable haze necessarily because there's a lot of hop debris in it, but definitely a noticeable haze that changes the appearance of the beer significantly. Rakao is not something I've ever tried before, so um, it should be interesting to see what the difference is between our base blonde ale, which I'm very familiar with, and this dry hop version. So let's see what happens. Wow. Okay, that's that's kind of nuts. Very much a New Zealand hop right there. <laughs> Getting that kind of um, pithy kind of character. There's definitely apricot in this, and I'm getting a lot of like a green pepper actually. And then yeah, like pithy citrus, pithy tropical fruit, a little bit of pineapple. There's like a greenish kind of unripe orange character to it as well. It's a very interesting character and I wouldn't say that I dislike it, um, but it's maybe not exactly what I would necessarily use in this particular recipe. Um, I'd probably stick with another West Coast hop um, or just more Cascade in the dry hop uh, to kind of make the flavors blend together a bit better. It is cool though, seeing just how a single change in your recipe, like dry hopping your beer, can massively, massively impact the overall character of it. I think at the end of the day, I still prefer the crisp and clean and uh, slightly hoppy character of the base blonde ale over the dry hopped one. Um, but that's just my personal palate. Your preferences may vary. Let me know in the comments which beer you think you would prefer. This is fun stuff to experiment with and these pressurized growler systems honestly could not make it easier. Now, if you're interested in picking up one of these pressurized growler systems, check out the link in the description box. They make fantastic Christmas presents. Um, and it's a really fun way, like I said, to experiment with dry hops without ruining your entire batch. Pretty fun stuff. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful. And if you did, please go ahead, hit that like button and subscribe as well if you haven't already. Please comment down below. What are your thoughts on this video? What are your thoughts on brewing blonde ales? Are you an experimental dry hopper like I am? And if so, what do you like to dry hop your blonde ales with? If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. Uh, this design and many others are available on my merchandise store, which is linked in the description box. There's also a Patreon for the channel as well. My Patreon supporters have helped a ton in helping me be able to upgrade the production quality for the channel and also get some really cool toys to play with. So I really appreciate all of the support that Patreon has delivered. There's also channel memberships with some benefits and there's the super thanks button as well. If you wanna hit either of those things, I really appreciate the support nonetheless. I have an Amazon store in the description box as well where you can find all the channel production equipment, where you can find all of the home brewing equipment that I really recommend that's available on Amazon. And if you're curious about the growler system that I've showed off in this video, that's available on that store as well. If you wanna follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check those links out for some more 
frequent content updates so you can see what's going to come to the channel in the very near future. And if you still are watching at this point, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. These videos always took a lot of work to produce, but they take a bit more now because I have a brand new infant um, who I'm taking care of and is sitting over there sleeping in the corner. Because of all that though, I just really appreciate that you're watching all the way to the end and uh, it means a lot to me. So anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you brew this beer and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So until the next one, this one goes out to you. Cheers.